You're listening to a content production of Higher Things. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving, or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents Why Bodies Matter with hosts Erica Sorensen and Pastor Harrison Goodman. Because we had always talked to them like they were just people that were shorter than us um, and not like that they were a different type of human being called a child. Welcome everyone to Why Bodies Matter, a podcast produced by Higher Things for youth and their adults too. The title of today's episode is Bodies Matter in Adulthood and Parenthood. I'm your co-host Erica Sorensen along with Pastor Harrison Goodman. Pastor Goodman, we introduce our guest today. I am really excited. Uh, Scott Keith is the executive director of 1517. He is the co-host of the Thinking Fellows podcast and the Tough Text podcast. He's a contributor to 1517 and Christ Holds Fast. Uh, he has earned his doctorate from the Foundation House of Oxford under the sponsorship of the Graduate Theological Foundation, studying under Jim Nestigan. He's the author of Being Dad. He is the author of Meeting Melanchthon, How Melanchthon Helped Luther Discover the Gospel, and Handing Over the Goods, Determined to Proclaim Nothing But Christ and Him Crucified. And uh, I think he's a grandpa too. He keeps yes. kind of busy. Four time, almost five time grandpa. Almost five time. Soon. Very soon. Yeah. yeah. Very soon. Welcome. We're glad hey. to have you. It's good to be here. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about adulthood and parenthood. Um, and super, I mean, delighted to have you here. You have two Gen Z kids, right? Yeah, and we just, we just, just figured outside. that out. I thought yeah. they were. I thought I had one Gen Zer, but I have two. You have two Gen Z kids, so three adult kids. Three adult um, kids. We'll talk. We'll talk a little bit about, about more about that, and then you have some Gen Alpha kids that are coming along the way. Or, well, I Is mean, great kids. Called? I should say they're Is they're that... they're calling them Alpha. I think. Oh I think. wow, that's so, interesting. You never know if the name will stick or not. Yeah. Gonna, yeah, it's not terribly original. We've gone with. You kind of Gen Y, Millennial, Gen Z, and then, I don't know, yeah. Gen Alpha. I guess I've they're just, just starting some, some more listening. I got really into this whole, uh, you know, what generation are you thing when I was working at Concordia in student services, and it seemed really important to, you know, know this. But I've lapsed in the meantime on keeping up. Well, I mean, you you live it. You've got family that are in the generation, so let, let's talk a little bit about it. I'm actually going to reference... Um, I've been reading a lot on Jean Twenge, I believe. She's done um, the iGen book. She yes. has done a, a couple of different books, and she kind of does the generational studies, which I think I'm is really I'm reading great. her generations right now, actually. Yes, I am too. I'm actually doing that book, and then she has another one on uh, narcissism and so forth. Yeah, That's yeah. kind of interesting It's one of well. three books I'm working on right now, so she's kind of in the background, but I did get a couple chapters in. Yeah, and a lot of the stuff is is really interesting. And this this latest one on generation, she uses quite a bit. She used twenty four data sets instead of four, so there's quite a bit more information right. on that. But and she did one on millennials that I read like probably ten years. Yes, ago. yeah, yeah, that one too. So she she uh, she brings some interesting information to the forefront. So I'm actually going to start with that. Um, so some of her research has, has shown, and it's not terribly surprising, that kids are feeling really disconnected and without kind of an intrinsic purpose, which probably is not real surprising considering how technology has worked for this generation. Um, so, so these problems with kids feeling disconnected, right, because they live in a virtual world, um, they, went, they went through COVID. Um, yes. And then, of course, there was they're reporting this generation, in particular Gen Z, and again, they're born about 1997 to 2012 is kind of the, the gap we're talking about here. So the kids that we work with at Higher Things um, are also reporting feeling sort of irreligious, not as like the, the figuring out the meaning of life and the purpose of life is less and less important. So what do you think in this generation, the role of an adult who's around kids or, or more importantly, the role of a parent? Um, is to kind of address some of those problems. What sorts of things can we can we think about that might potentially be helpful? 
You know, it's kind of funny. Um, your husband was up here last night, and there was a big kind of men's group thing. And one of the guys that works for us brought his recently high school graduate son, which was fun because I hadn't seen him since we were going to the same church. Mm -hmm. And um, as we were talking, his dad mentioned his sophomore year, and he goes, I didn't have a sophomore year. And yeah. I didn't, I didn't understand it because my kids weren't in high school when COVID hit. I just, I didn't under, even understand. Because I thought maybe he's like a year abroad or I don't really know what right, he's yeah. talking about. Or he was sick or something. And yeah. Was and I said, much. oh yeah, it's when you were 15. He goes, yeah, I know. I just was stuck in my house for a year when I was 15. I was like, oh yeah. So, um, I, weirdly enough, I've never really spent a lot of time thinking because my kids were all grown when this happened. So we mm -hmm. all thought about this from the perspective of like adults, you know, even though I see my kids almost every day, you know, it was like, can I go to the grocery store? Can I, you know, go to a restaurant, whatever. It wasn't my life, which is high school has now stopped for a year. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was interesting to think about that as he said that. And um, I think your question of now, how do parents interact with this feeling? Um, you know, we used, when I was back at the university, we used to talk about this in terms of the sort of, I'll say incarnational, but I mean like body disconnection yes. um, that comes from social media and from, you know, primarily quote unquote online relationships and, you know, what that was doing. I can see it in my own kids to some degree, like my oldest son, who's almost, well, he's 28, I think. Um, he's no problem doing what I would kind of call the normal stuff for my life, talking on the phone mm -hmm. with people, mm -hmm. all that. But mm -hmm. you get down to my younger ones and they're, you know, in, worse and worse at it in a sense. Like mm -hmm. Josh is pretty good with that kind of normal interaction stuff. But by the time you get to my youngest, Autumn, like she cannot stand talking on the phone with people. Well, she'll call mm -hmm. me and she'll chat me up on the phone just because I'm her dad. But generally like she's getting better at it because she's grown up has a kid now and everything but calling people to make appointments and all that kind of thing was very hard um and i think there's some of that that's just unavoidable as the technology changes and I, it's difficult to know when you're actually raising children what the technological and sort of societal changes are going to do to them into adulthood you don't really know it because if you think about it you're experiencing these changes as they are uh, my my for instance on that is like i got an iphone right around the time caleb got an iphone right because he's a techie kid um so i wasn't really like thinking about well what is this going to do to caleb growing up because there wasn't i mean, I'm suppose there was facebook and that kind of thing but it wasn't sort of um, an all encompassing way of living your life that you checked in on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or um, my, uh, I almost said MySpace. Geez, I'm sure how old I am. Um, <laughs> I was thinking the video one, TikTok um, or whatever, you know. And yeah, so I think that's a really hard question. Um, we always did our best to just, and I say this to people all the time because once I wrote Being Dad, the which is not a parental parental advice book, um, but the title, you know, um, makes it so that you write a book like that and everybody asks you, so how should I raise my kids? And I'm like, man, I don't know. <laughs> Just like, um, I can tell you some of the things that we did that I actually think did play off in the end, uh, pay off in the end. And one of those was just to always talk to our kids like they were people and not like they were kids. Um, it made it really easy when some of these tough conversations came up about technology, sex, dating, you know, you, you name it, um, drugs, alcohol, friendships, how to pick good friends and everything, because we had always talked to them like they were just people that were shorter than us. Um, and not like that they were a different type of human being called a child. It made those conversations a lot easier. Now by easier, I mean, easier to dialogue, um, it didn't make the solutions if there were any easier to the problem. So I don't want to give parents like a false, everything was perfect. Um, but the dialogue, you know, their ability to explain what was going on to us and our ability to explain what we wanted and expected from them in return was always very understandable because they were used to just talking to us like we were people. And I think that is going to be even more important as technology 
removes us, okay, I'm going to say incarnationally again, but I mean like peopling, like face-to-face, flesh-to-flesh kind of thing, removes us being able to have you know, clear, understandable communication with the people that you love is going to be even more important as time goes by. So sort of that, that that, no, it does. That you, you talk about it's sort of like the family is kind of that first community right. um, of engagement. And, and I, and um, one of the things that I was thinking of as you were talking is, um, you know, kids, because they have access to technology, have access to so much information in the way that we never we never did. Oh, so it's, it's almost, so it's so much, but, um, kids really still, I think what I hear you saying is kids really still need to engage in meaningful dialogue with, um, the people that are given to them by God in their life to yeah. guide and lead them. And so having that, having that connection point, even though you have all this technology, which can expose you to, oh gosh, so much information, good, bad, all, you know, we can, we could argue the merits of it all day long, but really connecting is, is part of the family first. Is well, kind it of changes like, everything so, yeah. in a sense. I mean, it, it it, in one sense, it changes nothing, right? Um, people are still people. God's right. love for people in Christ is still God's love for people in Christ. Um, you are, we, we would say in Lutheranism, uh, called, in other words, that, that God is actually placing you in a place and vocationally, and all that means is just that something you, you do, right? So God is calling you to do these interactions with people um, all throughout your life, but it will always start with the people that are closest to you, which we yeah. usually call family, um, yeah. right? So mother, father, husband, wife, children, un- aunts, uncles, grandparents, you know, from there, the circle kind of gets larger and larger to friends, coworkers, schoolmates, and on and on and on. Um, but it, the information is really interesting. I mean, I, I think about mm-hmm. Caleb and I talk a lot, my oldest son, and he's got three, almost four kids now. And the number of decisions that they're able to make, even even say like about things about, um, I hope this doesn't get too explicit here, but like birth control and mm-hmm. vaccines um, mm-hmm. that Joy and I, you know, in order to get the information that's available to he and Erica to make decisions, when yeah. Joy and I were raising him, I didn't, I couldn't even really tell you how I would have gotten that information. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. you weren't, it wasn't even very clear when I was having kids in my twenties, like what birth control did. Right. And mm-hmm. what the differences between the very, I mean, there was some obvious ones, but like say the birth control pill, it was very difficult to give information on like, what's going on there. Is this ethical? Is it not ethical? Yeah. It, to get that information, you had to rely on a doctor and the doctor had a perspective that was given to him through the medical community, which isn't necessarily informed by anything that God would tell us is right or wrong. Um, right. Right. And, but you can get that information now. Um, yes. and, you, and so there's, that's the positive side to that. And you're able to make more informed decisions about your family and how you want to handle these types mm-hmm. of things that just didn't exist. Um, and it's so clear, I'm sure it was possible to get the information, but the amount of work that you would have to do. To yeah. You had, you had to be really insistent that for something yeah. like that, you start with your doctor and then you go, well, who else knows about this? Yeah, I mean, you're you might go to the library. Like you might do an yeah. interlibrary loans on sort yes. of medical yeah. journal articles that maybe your library didn't carry, you know, and, it's and then like, you don't necessarily have the vocabulary for, so it's going to take right. even more time Yeah, and all the jargon and so forth. Yeah. All of which is possible. Same thing with vaccines, right? And same yeah, thing yeah. with, you know, um, even Caleb and Erica for this last baby, they're going to a birthing center, you know, yeah. instead yeah. of to a hospital. Joy and I didn't even know such thing was an option. Like right. if, it, if we had yeah. known, maybe we'd have done, but we didn't have that kind of information available to us. Yeah. So, yeah. so Jesus says, you know, my sheep hear my voice and, and, and they, they know me and they follow me. And I, I mean, we recognize this, uh, that, that, you know, your pastor gets to speak for Christ, but even the, the fourth commandment exists at all, that, that we would honor our father and mother because our, our, our Lord would speak good to us through our parents. It, it, you're right. It's kind of shifted before just sort of our parents taught us what to think, but now there's so much more, more information that it, it becomes really important that our, our parents start to teach us how to think Oh, yeah, uh, that, that I, as a mother I and a father, that, that, so that, that we would, we would model that. Right. Yeah. Well, and I, and I'd go back to what I first said, you can't actually teach your kids how to think if you don't teach them how to interact verbally on an, you know, a normal level with other people. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, this sort of child talk that we sometimes tend to do because these people are smaller than us is kind of funny. 
Um, you know, at, mm-hmm. at a fairly early age, they can just understand normal words said in normal tones. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, they can, as, yeah. especially if you, you know, if you just keep the bar there, they, yeah. they'll reach the bar. And then I know this. I, I have an 18 month old grandson that tests this theory all the time. He is parkour baby too. He can climb oh anything. Gosh. He's, he's amazing. I used to call him my favorite. He's changing my opinion a little. Bit. <laughs> he's, he's, he's he's approaching terrible twos though. Yeah, he's gonna he really have his is. day. And now I've got a younger grandson that could be my favorite. So. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so uh, so I want to talk a little bit about also what's going on with Gen Z. Um, you know, larger numbers of you know kids reporting mental health issues, uh, a lot of self-harm going on. We can you know, sit here and talk about the internet as well. Um, a lot of trauma. One, it, like about half of a class of kids nowadays, they're telling teacher has it have experienced some sort of pretty significant traumatic event, either vicariously or in person. So we've got a lot of kids dealing with a lot of stuff, meaning that and it's not always parents' fault, right? I don't, I don't mean to imply that. But, you know, we've got kids, some kids who have both parents, some kids who have one parent. Um, all kids have imperfect parents. Um, what sort of help can uh, our faith give give kids who are interacting right now um, with life? And um, kind of, I mean, it can be kind of despairing if you think about some of the statistics that are, that are coming out about Gen Z and mental health and so forth. Yeah, well, and it started with... Um, late millennials, because when I was at the Did. university, the the yeah. the rate of what they would call suicidality um, in mm-hmm. that age group that doesn't mean they're all going to commit suicide. It just means they have thoughts and plans and that type of stuff. But um, yeah, it just jumped in that generation from say like our generation. Um, yeah, really jumped there, and it just kind of kept going up. And, you know, it'll be, it'll be years before there's enough data to know exactly what the combination of things is that has led to this. I mean, almost certainly the disconnectedness of digital relationships has something Mm -hmm. to do with it. They don't know exactly what, or again, it might be time. I'm actually on the board of directors for a organization that provides, um, tries to provide free mental health care to students who have experienced abuse and trauma, mm-hmm. but that go to Christian schools where this care isn't provided for free like it is in public schools. Right. Yeah. Um, and we, we were, it's funny, yes, because we were writing up sort of like, why is this important to Christians? Um, and one mm-hmm. of the things when I was helping the the director write this up, I said, you know, the, the, the goal at the end of the day for an organization like this should, is going to be, you know, the safety and welfare of the child, but it's also going to be that this child can someday really hear the love of Christ, you know, the love of God for them as expressed in the death and resurrection of Christ for them. Um, yeah. Clearly in that the Holy Spirit works on them to bring them and to keep them in faith, which will certainly be a leg up in all things, um, including sort of overcoming this quote unquote trauma in their life. But sometimes there has to be some sort of pre-work, you know, to yeah. to just help the uh, the distraughtness help, yeah. that, that, Un- that, help that they've experienced. All the damage. Yeah. yeah, so that um, this message of Christ for them isn't, you know, one message among all the horrible messages that they've heard in their life too. And so, I think there's there's an interplay there. Um, the gospel is at the end of the day the only true hope, right? Um, yep. I tell this people all the time that are worried about our current political situation, no matter what side you're on. I'm like, if you worry too much about that, you're putting your hope in the wrong place. You're putting it in kings and princes and men. Um, mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, we actually, as Christians, only have one hope, and that's in Christ Jesus. And we know that one day, either by our death or by his returning, he will come to bring us home. Um, and that we'll be with him. And that when we open our eyes, we'll see his face and our hope will be fulfilled. Um, yeah. And that message is just so important. And but the more that message can be embodied by a physical person, yes, we call a preacher. Now, this preacher, as Patrick said, can uh, can come. I'm sorry, Harrison can come in the form of a parent. It can come in the form of a pastor. Um, but it's just somebody, some person's lips, and hands, and tears, and hugs and words that come um 
in the message of Christ's reconciliation, Christ's forgiveness for them. Yeah. Um, that's where the only hope is. And the more that that's connected to a person who Christ has also redeemed, um, that is embodied right in front of them. I mean, yeah. God bless them if it's a, a pastor who loves them and yes. preaches yeah. the gospel. God bless them if it's a parent who cares for them daily or and, also, even. and then gives them the gospel. Yeah. God bless them if it's a friend, yeah. um, you know, right in yeah. front of them. Um, yeah. knowing that somebody really in front of them cares enough about them to yeah. share the gospel with them. Yeah. Right. There's That's also everything. something really wonderful about that person being fallible. Um, it, we, we always sort of go looking for the theology of glory. We, we always sort of want to stand with the, the Pharisees at the foot of the cross and say, if you really are the Christ, come down from there. Like if, if, if you're going to save us, do it in a way that I want do it, do it in a way that measures up to my standards and perfect to actually see Christ embody somebody who, who cannot come down from the cross to, to see Christ embody somebody who actually just needs the cross. Right. Uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it helps to make sense of, of all of the things where I say, God, you could not possibly work in this broken home. You could not possibly right. work with this Amen. pastor. Yeah. And, and to, to find a, a, a theology of the cross, it lets us not just sort of look forward to the glory, but, but even find hope in the now. It's a down and dirty God that works in down and dirty situations um, through the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. I stole, fr- stolen from Jim Neskin, but in my talks, I often put the line, from one sinner's mouth to another sinner's ear and by the power mm. of the Holy Spirit into that sinner's heart to turn it from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And, you know, these are sinners to sinners. These aren't perfect people to perfect people. These are broken people to broken people, people who have experienced trauma to other people who have experienced trauma and on and on and on. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful thing. Well, I think we have time for uh, one more question. I, I, I want to get out and hopefully it's not going to take too terribly long, but um I, I'd like to kind of direct the question towards sort of how does um, we're talking about the family unit being a being a parent, eventually an adult uh, and eventually a parent for some of the kids. But how does a person's uh, maleness or femaleness sort of uniquely brings bring gifts into the family that, you know, the fact that your mom or your daughter or your son or your husband or dad or whatever, how does your your male or femaleness, um, sort of help, help inform your job in the family or your yeah, vocation so, in the family. Somebody could write a whole book about that. I mean, yeah, maybe, for sure. Maybe, maybe somebody has, um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, at the end of the day, you could say a couple of really simple things that would be, if, if people are interested in, they can do more looking into, I mean, there's, yeah. a, there's a real obvious one, right? Biologically, it takes both of these people, male and female to make a family. Um, this is what God says. The two will become one flesh, um, be fruitful and multiply, populate the entire earth, which is something that we don't take as seriously, um, even among Christians today, as we ought to. Um, you know, as much as people don't want to look at it as a reality, one of the other generational things that's happening is there's a dramatic reduction in um, procreation. Um, and this is, you know, this this disembodiment and disincarnational sort of way of living your life is going into uh, people's interest in getting married, people's interest in making love and making children and the whole nine yards. And it's just on and on. Um, So first of all, it takes a man and a woman in order to come together, become one flesh and make a family. Um, That's like the most primary thing. Now within, once that family is there, um, I believe that God has called, has has set up this sort of mother father relationship because the two, um, when understand, stood correctly in their sort of unique and not the same, um, vocational roles in the household, um, that they make a very good team, you know, Mm -hmm. that, um, as it's set up, you know, you have two people who are not the same and who do not bring the same things to the table, um, but Mm -hmm. bring, different things, a different way of expressing love, a different way of expressing care, a different way of teaching, a different way of encouraging independence, a different way of encouraging dependence, a different way mm-hmm. of encourage, uh, encourage encouragement, um, mm-hmm. and that they complement one another, um, and that both are needed, um, and that both are important. Um, one of the things that you see now is that, and I'm just going to say it, is that the role of the husband and the father in the house is incredibly downplayed. Mm-hmm. Um, when even, you know, 
non-Christian uh, secular data would tell us that it's uh, one of the most important things uh, a child yeah. can have in their life in order to not just be successful, but also to come to and to stay in the faith, um, if that's mm -hmm. important to you, which I assume for your listeners it is. Um, yeah. And so it, it's very important for people to realize that this is not something that you're intended to try to go at alone, that yeah. it's the reason that sex is protected behind the marital vows. Um, it's for your safety, it's for your uh, spouse's safety, and it's for the uh, propagation and continuance of the family, which yeah. at the end of the day is the command to populate the earth because it's for the propagation and continuance of the human race. <laughs> which And God called that good. It's good. And God, God called that good. Yeah. And that when this is seen through uh, the means by which God has called us to do it, that that's how it's supposed to be. And that any variation of that, even if it's a one where there's not personal sin involved, in other words, some maybe one of the, like in my case, one of the parents dies, um, mm -hmm. that that is the result of sin. And it is not the ideal, um, right. right? Divorce, the result of sin, not the ideal. Single no. parenting, the result of sin, not the ideal. Can good situations, you know, individual situations still come out of this? Well, there are exceptions to everything. Um, but on the whole, um, you see the best outcomes when these things are practiced the way God intended. Yeah. Yeah. There's gift in all that. There's gift in well, all that. And that's how also yeah. yeah, when people aren't burdened by doing all of the responsibilities by themselves, that's when they actually yes. have the time to catechize. That's when yes. they have the time to absolve sins. That's when they have the time to share the gospel with their family and their children. And they're yeah. not just by themselves trying to get all the day-to-day -day stuff done, the, the feeding, the getting to school, the getting to practice by with one person. You split this, you split this load. And now somebody can make dinner and the family can sit down and they can talk about their days and they can be absolved at the dinner table. They can hang a catechism poster on their wall and go through the first and second commandment and you know, whatever, you know, this, but it's much harder to do when it's just one person trying to make it yeah, all work have, for an entire family. You don't have family. bandwidth. You're just trying yeah. to, it's just, mm -hmm. you're just doing the best you can. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's, um, um, one, just kind of one last thing to tease out. Um, there are, like, as we mentioned, there are a lot of kids who don't have that situation. What kind of, and, and, you know, I used to, I mean, my, my kids, um, have experienced divorce. Um, and I used to tell them, um, it's not your fault, but it is your problem. And you know, it's, it's not yeah. fair. Um, but, but that's pretty, that's pretty tough. What kind of, what kind rough, of hope yeah. can you, what kind of hope can you find if you are not in sort of that ideal situation, um, you find yourself in, you know, through no fault of your own. Um, and you just kind of have to live with it, kind of live with the broken family and live with the brokenness. Yeah. Um, what kind of hope can you give? Well, you can, you can understand, I think, and I think, children are completely capable of this, that, um, things will seem harder. Um, but then you'll adjust to what is now your life. Um, and that your hope is not in any individual outcome of any individual day in this life or week in this life or month in this life or year in this life, all of which might be hard. Um, but that your ultimate hope is in the gospel of Jesus Christ for you, the yeah. death and resurrection of Christ for you. Now, that's easy to say and hard to do because life will be hard. Um, I, you know, I know that my dad died when I was two years old. Um, my mom raised my brother and I, and she was a young mom when she was uh, 19 when she had me, um, raised wow. me and what is my older brother, who was my dad's son from another marriage from the time my dad died when she was 21. Um, wow. And you know, it was great and it was hard, but every life is great and hard. Just because yeah. that you say that the ideal is two parents and children doesn't mean that there aren't those lives that are great and hard. Yeah. Um, none of that changes what our ultimate hope is. Um, and the more that you can expose your kids to people that will, and not just you, that will tell them that to pastors and to teachers. And I'd say, especially in the, ki the case of kids who are in a home where there is no father, of uncles, of grandpas, yeah. um, you know, so that you can get that man back into their life in some function or 
form or function. My mom very much prioritized that. I lived two blocks from my grandpa. I lived two miles from my uncle. She made sure that I had great friends around me who had great fathers that um, were willing to take me camping and these types of things. Um, and and could share the gospel with me and could forgive me, right? Who could who could get mad at me when I did wrong and then yeah. forgive me when I was crying because they called me out on the stupid stuff I was doing. Yeah. Um, and it's just very important and it can be done. Um, it's harder for you as the parent, yeah. you know, yeah. more work, but it's worth it. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I think we're out of time, so we're going to wrap it up. Dr. Scott Key, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us today, today to discuss our faith in the flesh for this disembodied age. There is hope. There's hope in the gospel. Thank you. You're welcome.